these guys? You guys are staying for the office hours? Staying for that question. Pardon me? Same, same with that. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so then you guys going to take a seat then? These office hours are not like a time to work as a group on things. Yeah. Not, not for like people to start working as a group and, you know. So if you're staying for the office hours, then you've got to take a seat. Because otherwise there's going to be too much noise. If these guys start talking, if these guys start talking, then... <laughs> It's too much noise. So you guys could work together uh, in a different room if you wanted to, maybe. but um, for the office hours, it's just going to be exactly like the classes. Okay. So, um, Arya, you had a question. Yeah. What's the question? Oh, it's from my assignments. I think. Oh, I'm, I'm assuming that either they made an error or I don't know, I'm just confused. Like, okay. What happened on the assignment? Okay. And then I'll put it on the board so the yeah. class can see. Okay. So over here, uh, this was question three. I should I pull up the questions? I have the questions. Oh, okay. So question three of assignment three. So that was, uh, oh, okay, this is, yeah. No, no, this is not question two, this is question one. Question one, okay. W one A, B, C, or D? Um, C. One C, okay. So let me write it down on the board so that everyone here knows. For every integer n, n squared plus three n minus five is odd? Yes. So for all n in the integers, n squared plus three n, yeah. Plus three n minus five is odd. Okay. Then what's the problem? So pretty much what I do, I said I made two cases where n is even mm -hmm. and n is odd. Yeah. But the thing is, they literally said this is too big. Try writing n is equal to three k plus one, which I literally wrote. And for the odd case, and for the even case, it says write n is equal to two l, which I wrote two m. Okay. Yeah. So your uh, your best um, your best thing to do is to take a screenshot of what happened, mm -hmm. post it on Piazza. Let someone. You didn't do that yet. No. Because if you do that, there's 13 instructors. Like I've been teaching for the last two hours. Mm -hmm. While I'm teaching, another instructor might have answered your question by now about that. Yeah. Because um, there's an average response time of 10 minutes on Piazza. So, oh, yes. yeah. I so, but you know how to prove. Everyone knows how to prove this. Yeah, how would you prove it, Eric? Not off the back of my head, I wouldn't give it. Really? You can't prove this off the back of your head? On the midterm, you're going to have to do it on the back of your head? Versano? It seems like he was yeah, saying one where n is 2k plus 1, one where n is 2k. Okay, so assume that it's even, assume that it's odd. If it's even, it can either be even or odd. There's yeah. no other thing, right? And then what happens is you're able to, what is it, like factor it to where it's uh, an even number, either mm -hmm. 4 or 2 or something like that. Mm -hmm. multiplied by an integer yeah plus one yeah and my common knowledge you know that that's odd and then yeah. the other time is you have something even either two or four multiplied by an integer which is even by common yeah integer. okay it seems no one else has any problem with this nola are you okay with this type of problem yeah, yeah okay yeah so uh i think another thing have you looked at the solutions that were printed out yeah, I didn't have it. So you've seen yeah. what they did. Yeah. So take a screenshot of that, showing all the evidence, the case one, the case two, and what the grader put, mm -hmm. and then post it on Piazza, say, what did I do wrong here? Okay. And some instructor is basically gonna say that you should get the marks here. And then I will, uh, then the next thing, you know how to do regrade requests? Does everyone know how to do regrade requests? Yeah. It's on learn the instructions for that, right? So there's, there's five different graders, one of them for question one, one of them for question two, one of them for question three, one of them for question four, one of them for question five. And there's email addresses for each of those five people. So it's like for Q1, you email this person, for Q3, you email that person. And once, once you've asked on Piazza and an instructor has said you should get the grades, you, you take a link to, you take a link 
to that uh, Piazza question, the URL, and you give and you email the grader for that question. So you're going to email the grader for question one with a link to the Piazza saying an instructor said that I should get the marks here, and then they'll do a regrading. Okay. Your mark can go up or down if you do a regrade request. And then if you disagree with the regrade request, then you email me. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Because otherwise, there's 1,300 students. Me, if people come to me for everything, then uh, yeah. So I think you should post that on Piazza, and you'll get an answer quicker than what I can do. Because I've got to do this office hour now, right? So people. So uh, now he's done. So did you guys have a question about the prime number one? Or uh, oh, okay, okay. Did anyone have, have any questions? Everyone stays for the office hours, but they don't have any specific questions. Since you use the example of the hand sanitizer there, you find an example where there is hand sanitizer, now there's hand sanitizer. Yeah. I find that the specific example of a crime where there's three, and then I find another example of a crime which is greater than three, that's five. Yeah. Okay, but what if I give you a prime that's 90, uh, 90,000 digits long? Are you going to find me a prime bigger than that? How are you going to find a prime bigger than the, the primes get further and further spread apart as you get them larger? As they get larger, you're going to get primes that are further and further apart. It's going to be harder and harder for you to find a prime. No problem. Why would you have to start with separate data? Prime number three. You're well, I'm five. saying there's an infinite number of prime numbers. You're saying that if you get, if I give you three, you can give me a prime number bigger than that. That's five. Sure, you know how to do that. If I give you a small prime number, what if I give you a big prime number? You can't give me a you can't give me one larger than it. If I give you a prime number with seventy digits long, how are you going to give me a prime? Do you, do you know the next prime? You don't need to show that, right? Then we just show that the list is incomplete. So the yeah. prime is equal to the products of the primes plus one. So that's we don't know whether that's a prime or not. There are only two options. Either that is a prime or that is not a prime. Okay. Right. So mm -hmm. I think then we proceed with the I think with two cases. If we consider it's uh, a prime, then we have anyway shown that the list if it's a prime, prime, then it's a prime. If it's what what if it's not a prime? Yeah. Well, if it's not a prime, then I think it should have been in that list of why. Like, because uh, if, if it's not a prime, then it uh, wouldn't be. It, it would have a factor other than one in itself. Yeah. Okay. So we have I'm going to put probably m equals one times two times three times five times seven times all the way up to q okay so and then i'm adding one to it right yeah so why is this not a prime or what so you're saying you're saying this is if it's, if it's not a prime then it has a factor other than one right so it already it could have a factor okay. other than one if m is not prime Then it probably has a factor other than one and hence it's in the list, I guess. M equals what do you want to say? R times S, yes. where R and S are not equal to one and, and, yeah. and, and not equal to, to M. Yeah, not equal to M and itself. Yeah. And, and we know that every teacher has to be one part. That has to be a product of the one and some prime numbers. And it's not a so it has to be one time yeah. Okay, okay. So so R times S. So what, what do you want to say in the next line of your proof? So either R or so R S contains a prime. That is in that list. That is in that list. Yes. Yeah, so R and S contains a prime that's in that list of one. So R contains a prime that's in what list? That list? Yeah, one, two, and three. Up to you. That's impossible because it's plus one. Yeah, that's impossible because it's yeah. So what? So R, R contains something inside that list, and uh, that's not possible because that's a contradiction because we wrote that list plus one. So since that's a contradiction, I wait. What's the contradiction? 
So, so we, we assume that, so we took two cases. Yeah. Uh, the first case that we actually have to consider is uh, M is a prime. So that's anyway, that's done. But the second case is when M is not a prime, mm -hmm. then we show that uh, M could be of the form R into S. Yeah. Where R and S are not equal to one and N. Yeah, that's what I have on the board. Yeah, and uh, then we show that if that's the case, then uh, that number has to be in the list that we wrote. One. What number has to be in the list? The, the M. The capital M. Yeah, the capital M. The Why M. does it have to be in that list? Because it has a factor other than one in itself. So why does M have to be in that list? Because I, I don't know, because you know there, there would be something that divides M, so it has to be in that list. <coughs> what list? The, the, the one into two and three. This no, list, right? You're talking about this yes, list? That, yeah, one. What, why does M have to be in that list? I thought M is that list. M is that list. M is the product of that list yeah. plus one. The product of the list. So, so, so basically, M is not a prime. So, so either is a prime or it's not a prime. If it's yeah. not a prime. If it's not a prime, it is a, it is a product. Of, it's a product of other primes. Okay. Yeah, it's a product of primes. Yeah. Yeah. That prime cannot be itself. That's a prime. So, what what prime cannot be itself? So, so now we assume that M is not a prime. So M is not a prime. I've I've put that on the board. So M is the product of prime. Prime. Of prime. So instead of doing R times S, you want to do M equals. Um, even if we write R times S, we can just write this product. So suppose we take our list of R one, R two. These are primes now, right? These are primes. So it's a product of some. R n, where R i are primes. Okay. And all those primes are smaller than uh, are smaller than n, so it has to appear from the thing. All of these primes are smaller than what? Smaller than n as well. Smaller than m. All right. Um, so uh, it has to also appear in the list of, of m minus one. Okay. So why do all of these have to be smaller than m? Because, uh, because the, the highest factor can only be m itself, and it's not m as per what you wrote previously. So uh, the product of the primes would be lesser than the number itself. Okay. So it has to be in that. So name. so hold on. So you need more lines in your proof, right? So let um, uh, b be the um, largest factor in m, right? Yeah. Largest factor in M. Or actually, this doesn't need to be B. This can just be Rn, right? That's the last, that's the largest factor. Yeah. Let Rn be yeah, the largest Rn. factor. Yeah. Be the largest factor in M. Okay. And what do we know about Rn? And Rn doesn't equal to M. Rn does not equal to M. That's because we assumed that, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So Rn is smaller than M. So Rn is smaller than M. Why? Uh, because they're both integers, and Rn has to multiply by something else to equal M. And, mm -hmm. and those Rn or whatever that is multiplied onto it are integers. Or just yeah, like, so or a one statement, we could just say that uh, the the factors, the product of factors of any number cannot be greater than the number itself. Mm -hmm. So Rn is less than M. How, do, how have we proven that Rn is less than Q? Because Q is the most important part here. Q is the last prime. But we've assumed that Q is the last prime. There's no primes bigger than Q. So how do we prove that Rn is less than Q? No, I'm less than or equal to Q. Less than or equal to Q. Yeah. Uh, Can it not be between Q and one? And Q and Q plus one or something? They're integers, right? So yeah. We mentioned that the method cannot be between Q and Q plus one, but there's no integer that exists mm -hmm. between Q and Q plus one. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's no. Um, 
There's no integer. I'm going to write it in short form. You're not going to do this on the midterm. You're going to write integer, but to speed things up today, I'm just going to say there's no integer um, less than what? Oh, oh between Q and Q plus one. Between Q and Q plus one, or uh, one times two times three, all the way up to Q and. This product in this product plus one or just Q and Q plus one? Which one do you want to write down? There's no integer between. I mean, did I? Oh, between. Could, couldn't we just say that since we define the R red as, an, as a prime, that we have already listed every single prime in the world? So it has to be yeah. uh, one, of, one of those primes. Can we just say that? Exactly. Yes. So we've already listed all the primes in the world. Okay, we've assumed that. We don't know if it's true. We've assumed it. Then we have M is a product of uh, primes. So what do you want to say? I want to say any anything in that product of primes, so any Rn is going to be one of the every single prime we've listed. So all of these are going to be in that yeah, list? Exactly. Why? Because Rn has to be a prime, and we have already listed every single prime. But we assumed that this is all the primes. So then you've not really contradicted anything. You've just said, Nola? Um, if, like, if it's not prime, then, then like, it's the multiplication of all the primes that we've assumed. If it's not prime, doesn't it have to have a greater prime factor than what's in the list? Um, if it's not prime. If it's not prime. Has like a number that is prime that you can like multiply, you can like divide it. So that means there is a greater prime that exists than what you're saying. I think you've all, I think both Robin, Arnav, and Nola, you've all got the idea. Um, I think, I think all three of you know by now why this is working, but how to write that in a, in a proof. Like, uh, what are you going to say if you if you want to write this down clearly? You were getting somewhere. You said there's no integer between what? Between Q and Q plus one or what? Between the products of one and two and three and five Q and that products plus one. So between Q minus one, between M minus yeah. one and M? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's no integer between M, M minus one and M. All right. So... So what? Pardon me? There's no integers between M minus one and M. Okay. So what does that tell me? It like doesn't tell you anything. It's that's a given. Obviously, there's no integer between two adjacent. No, no, that easier to something, right? I mean, that's just the fact that you're stating that shows that uh R N has to be lesser than or equal to M. Uh it, it has I mean the yeah, I need to think of how to formulate it. Mm -hmm. Like all we have to show is that the largest prime factor of M. Yeah. Is that's Q. Yeah, that's Q. oh wait, no, it's not necessarily Q. The largest prime factor of M is Rn. Yeah. Yeah. The largest prime factor, which is Rn is lesser than or equal to Q. And if it's lesser than or equal to Q, that means it's in the list M minus one. Okay. Why is it less than or equal to Q? Because we have assumed that Q is the largest prime factor. So Q is the largest prime number. And for a, yeah, for a number to exist, it's, it's the same thing that we assume, right? For a number to exist, um, its largest prime factor is going to be lesser than the number itself. Mm -hmm. So, so I feel like we're, we're, we're working on the two assumptions right now. So first assumption is that we have already listed every single prime. Yeah. Um, Q is the largest prime in the world. Yeah. Uh, and also we are assuming for the same time contradiction that M is not a prime. Yeah. This yeah. means that we are assuming for the same contradiction that M is a kind of prime. It's prime. Okay. And, uh, and because all the primes are natural numbers, uh, the product of uh, the, every single factor is smaller than uh, smaller than equal to m. Smaller than capital M, yeah. Smaller than capital M, and 
Um, and, for, and first of all, first of all, we know that m minus one is not a prime. Right? Yeah, because it's the product of a bunch of primes. Yeah. And uh, therefore, uh, therefore, for R m to be a prime, it has to be smaller than m minus I'm not smaller than or smaller than m minus one. Smaller than or equal to m minus one. Yeah, so we already we already know that it cannot be m. Okay. It cannot be m minus one. So it has to be smaller than m minus one. Yeah, smaller than m minus one. Obviously, smaller than m. So, for, so and also because if it's smaller than m minus one, it is smaller than q. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. If it's smaller than m minus one, then it has to be smaller than q. That means it's one of the primes. That well, wait, wait, why does it have to be smaller than q? So m minus one is one times two times three times five times q. That's bigger than q, isn't it? That's, that's, that's proving our yeah, that's proving our thing. Right? If it's bigger than q, that shows that there is a prime that's outside of that list. Oh, so it's bigger than q now. Yeah, I mean, okay, so then it's bigger than Q, then you've contradicted the thing. The, the initial. Just proved that the M is prime. So you guys are, are you guys following this? Rose, Tehran? But it's not in the list. Yeah, you're not, you're not following this? What's going on? Yeah, you got this proof? Tehran? No? Which part are you stuck at? Oh, okay. Okay. Rose, you understand? Yeah. So why why is there an infinite number of primes? Um, M minus one is always bigger than Q. But have you proven that M minus one is prime? M minus one is bigger than Q, but is it prime? What did you say right now? So you, you, you're proving, so M minus one is bigger than Q because it's a product of a bunch of things times Q. M minus one is, is bigger than Q. Not really, that is just contradicting what we did, right? I mean, how can m minus one be greater than q? m is equal to one and two q plus one. m minus one has to be bigger than q because it's equal to q times two times three times five. It's bigger than q. m minus yeah, one is. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah. yeah. m minus one is greater than q. Yeah. yeah. m minus one is greater than q. So there's a number bigger than q. m minus one is bigger than q. But is m minus one prime? But it's m minus one prime, so if it's, it's if it's not prime, is it? If it's not a prime, then our factors has to be in that list. But it's not in our list. There has to be a prime factor that's greater than q that exists. Uh huh. That's it, right? So if m minus one is greater than q, that means that it needs to have another prime factor, and that prime factor is not listed in our list in q. Because m minus one is greater than q, mm -hmm. and if m minus one is greater than q, by we know that if it's not a prime, it has to be written in a, it has to be written as a product of primes. Mm -hmm. So there has to be at least one prime number that's greater than q, and that contradicts our fact that q is the largest prime number. So the list is incomplete. We might not show what prime number it is, but we know that if m minus one is greater than q, it needs to have at least one prime factor that's greater than q, which we assume. Was well, no, if so. If something is greater than Q, it doesn't need to have a prime number bigger than a prime factor bigger than Q. If I just have two times Q, that's bigger than Q. And that doesn't have a prime factor bigger than Q. Two times Q is bigger than Q, and it doesn't have a prime factor bigger than Q inside it. I think it's proven that like if, since M is greater than Q, I would just prove that M is not divisible by anything up to Q. So it's either M is prime or it's divisible by a prime of Yeah. That's that's the idea. That's yeah. It. Yeah. But I think these guys have had that idea for a long time. They're just unable to put it into words. But that's good because you're supposed to think about how to write elegant proofs. On a midterm, you can't write 10 paragraphs saying, I know this, I know this, I know this, this is obviously this, this is obviously that. You've got to write it like boom, boom, boom. You've seen the assignment solutions. 
it's like 10 lines. It's like this, 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 done, right? So you get it, Nola? I do, I just don't want to it. Yeah, yeah. So that's something that uh, it would be a good idea to write it down, try to write down your own version of the proof. Keep doing it until you're convinced that you love this proof. Like this is, you like this proof. It's compact. It's not got too much extra stuff in it. And every step of the proof makes sense. If we find one, is there anything we can compare it to? So like, like there's nothing to compare it to? Like, mm -hmm. no. You're working with some friends? Uh, not that from this. Oh, you're working with just some friends on the assignments, but they don't care about this? No. Ah, you've got to find friends that, that uh, care at least as much as you about doing well on the midterm. You could probably find this proof on the internet, though. Like yeah, the the answer might be on the internet, but the thing about the internet is if you search on the internet, you might find something wrong. Because there's some there's some people out there making their own website. They think that they know math. And there's some like crackpot theorists that don't know what they're talking about. But they're like, you know, one person once told me that Toronto means meeting place. And I looked it up and there was an article saying armchair historians call it meeting place, but it really means something else. It's really a First Nations word from uh, there's this place many miles north of Toronto that had, the, you know, it doesn't mean meeting place. That's just uh, a, an urban myth. And there's armchair historians. That means they're not real historians. They're just people that think that they're historians or that, you know, they don't have the credentials, but they like history. They like to speculate about the history, but they haven't learned all the techniques to prove that something really happened. So armchair mathematicians are all over the internet, right? They'll, they'll, they'll say, I proved, I proved the Riemann hypothesis is true. You know, they, that's a million dollar problem. They'll say, I've proven that P does not equal NP. That's a million dollar problem as well. No one, the, the most elite mathematicians have not proven these things yet. And then there's crackpot theorists on the internet that say that they did. So it can be dangerous if you, you can look on the internet, if you find a proof that you agree with, make sure you, you really agree with that proof, then maybe it's okay. But um, if you find some proof on the internet it might not be valid. That's just the way the internet works, right? Because yeah. anyone can put something on the internet. Yeah, so you, you don't, you're not working with friends that would be interested in this? What about all these guys? <laughs> this is Versano, that's Eric. This is Johan. You don't have to just work with people from St. Jerome's. You can work with anyone, right? You guys are, Eric, you're St. Jerome's? Yeah, we're all You're three St. Jerome's? Yeah. So like, it's it's too, so. Okay. It's just convenient. Yeah. Well, if you're open to it, you guys can exchange contact information and try to work on assignments together. And sounds like uh, Nola's friends are not interested in this. So. <laughs> Henry? <laughs> Why do you want to pretend that you don't exist? See, the trick is you got to grow your hair out, you got to get a beard, and then you got to like change the clothing you wear. It's like hoodie, long, long pants, that sort of thing. Yeah, you called them my name once before, and I just kind of pretended I didn't exist. You're like, Henry's not here. Ah, that's Bruce. Oh, that's what you did. Oh, but now I know that Henry exists. <laughs> He starts calling people all here's the line. Oh, but that if, if I called out Henry and you didn't and you weren't here, then I put a tick next to your name. I marked you as absent. <laughs> I mean it depends. It did, well, some, I think some professors will get bonus marks for attendance, some won't. That's why they make you buy those um, bonus marks is one thing, but uh, what if four years from now you're looking for a job and you come to me asking for a letter of reference? And I just I, I, I don't remember because it's four years ago and I've had 2000 students between now and the four years. I look back at my attendance sheet. Oh, okay, this guy was never in class. 
<laughs> Am I going to write a good letter of reference for you? And what if what if you're on the edge, like you have you have an eighty nine percent, and you really want to have a ninety, you really want to have a ninety, and you ask me, I I knew how to do this, but the 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 grader gave me uh, the grader took off a mark. I really want this mark back. Then you know, it's up to me, right? It's my final call in that situation. So do you have? Are you someone that I trust? Or are you someone that gave me a hard time throughout the year, not showing up to class? You know. <laughs> uh, well, so if if you if you pretend that you're not here, then as far as I know, you're not here. And my records, four years later, my records say that you weren't here. All I know is that you weren't here. People that don't come here, they give me a hard time because you know what? Three classes later they show up and they start asking me questions. And I'm like, why do you not know this? This is divisibility. This is the definition of divisibility. You should have known this three lectures ago. Because they skipped all those lectures, they, that now gives me a hard time because now I have to slow down. I have to now explain something to someone because this person doesn't get it. And then the rest of the class, they want to move on to more interesting stuff. And that gives me a hard time because then I have to balance. So anyone not showing up to class is giving me a hard time for sure. <laughs> yeah, then that they're doing so at their own risk, right? You're in the other class? You're in the other class? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, which one? The 135, which yes. instructor? Carry no. Yeah. Okay. Did you have any questions for this officer? Oh, how did you know this question? Did Carrie also give that question? I tell me, I, I see this impression. I this impression. Oh, you came in and you saw that. So you came to the office hours. Did you have any questions that you came here for? Not yet. Okay, so you just came here just to see what's going on and you found that interesting. This is from a previous midterm. So it's very possible that a question, it's not going to be the same question on our midterm, but you should be able to do that. Pardon me? Zero, zero only divides zero. Zero doesn't divide anything up to zero. Does zero divide two? No, you Everything divides zero. Everything divides zero, but zero only divides zero. I think I might have an answer for it. Oh, for the second question. Okay, so. Now, what are you guys thinking about? What's going on at the back? You think you're still doing the prime number one? No. Okay. So Henry believes that he has a proof for the second question. Let's try that. So we don't need this on the board still. Actually, we only need one of these, right? We don't need both of these. We don't need this on the board still, right? Record it anyways. You can take a screenshot of it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, A cubed divides B cubed. That implies what? That, okay, so K A, so okay. B cubed equals K A cubed for K in the integers. All right. Q both sides. Okay. All right. This is what someone else tried, right? Yeah, but k the cube root of k doesn't have to be an integer. What if k is seven? Yeah, but the root of but, the, but we proved that k itself has to be an integer, and the cube root of an integer is either irrational or an, or another integer. True. 
True. But so k is an integer, but the cube root of k is not an integer. It is either has to be an integer or it has to be irrational. Let's say it's irrational. Then it then it fails because why does it fail? Because an irrational number of times it will not do that when you say that. Oh I see. All right. So assume that assume that um cube root of k is irrational is not an element of the rational numbers so that means that um there does not exist p and q in the integers such that cube root of k equals p over q Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does this say? You have a bunch of symbols that I don't like, that there does not exist symbol and that there isn't, isn't an element of. So what, what does this tell me? Well, it tells you that the, the cube root of k can be irrational, therefore it has to be an integer. Because we previously established that the cube root of any integer, because k is an integer, so the cube root of any, any integer is either another integer or irrational, and now we can just prove that it can't be irrational. <laughs> So it equals P over Q, where P and Q are integers. But just, just because it's not equal to B over A doesn't mean it's not equal to P over Q. No, I've, I've proven that the, we, 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 we assume that the Q root of any integer is either an integer or irrational. Yeah. So here you want to prove that it's not irrational. And we assume that B equals the Q root of K times A. We assume that is true. <laughs> And we also assume that A and B are integers. And we've taken the case where the cube root of K is an irrational number, and it's given that an irrational number times an integer cannot be an integer. So have, have you proven, so, okay, you've, you've assumed that the cube root of K is not uh, rational. Yeah. That's a given. So, okay, so, um, so maybe you want to say because that the way it was written down I, I don't know how where we're going to go from there but let's say we have m equals cube root of k assume m is um assume that m equals cube root of k and that m is irrational m is irrational then we have b equals m times a where m is irrational yeah okay and then you say that an irrational number times an integer cannot be an integer yes. yeah so um assume it's irrational hmm. yeah but you know that b is an integer so the only other option left is that k also has to be an integer m, m has to be an integer yeah uh, what he what he was saying that there are two cases, one where q root of k is irrational, and one where q root of k is an integer. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if it's an integer, then I think we're done. If it's if it's an integer, that case we don't have to worry about. So let's say it's irrational. We have case number two. Assume that m m is irrational. Then it has to be irrational. Why? So we have an irrational times an integer. So you're just going to use words. You're just going to say irrational times an integer must be so. Irrational, but then that's a contradiction that B is already an integer. So that means that M, that implies that M is an integer. And then I think I would like to do this more symbolically than just saying uh, irrational number times irrational number. Oh, sorry, an irrational number times an integer. Uh, if it's equal to an integer, then it must be. So let's let's do. Um, we have so m is an integer. So no, m is irrational. B so b equals. B over a equals m, right? B over a equals m, and b. If m is irrational, then for all integers a, a and b, b, b over a does not equal m. Oh, so it's irrational. But okay, so it's irrational. But we have that b equals m. 
Well, we've defined m to be cube root of k. So we've defined m. This is a real number, not a rational number. This is a real number. B equals real number times a. That means that b over a equals real number. But because these are integers, then that's rational. But m can't be just rational. It either has to be an integer or irrational. It can't be like a non-integer, but it's still rational. OK, so what? Uh, why can it not be a rational non-integer? That's the proof we discussed earlier. Is the cube root of any integer is either an integer or irrational. Uh, why, is it, why can't it be a fraction? Because if you have a fraction, then you have like p over q. And if you and if you like cube both sides of it, it can't be an integer. Wait. So the cube root of anything, the cube root of anything, just uh, not anything, any, any integer is either irrational. So the cube root of s, where s is an integer, that must be irrational. Or or an integer. integer. Why? When s is an integer, the condition is also when s is an integer, then the cube root of s has to be an integer or, or irrational. Or irrational. Why why can't it be a rational number that's not an integer? Say, Why can't it just be some fraction like three over seventeen? They'll have to prove by contradiction. Let's suppose that q root of s is equal to p over q. Okay. Assume assume that q root of s is equal to. Assume that this is equal to um, w over y for integers. W and Y in the integers and Y not equal to zero, right? Yeah, and W has to be of the form Y multiplied by. No, also, 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 Y doesn't divide W. Because it has to simplify the S with the Y. Also, Y doesn't divide W. Why not? Because we, we, we said that it had to be a rational non integer, so Y didn't have to divide W. Rational non integer, so Y does not divide W. Why does not divide W? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's a rational number that's not an integer. Yeah. Okay. What's wrong with this? Why is that assumption leading to a contradiction? Because if you cube both sides. Yeah. Okay. So now cube both sides. We get S equal to W over Y cubed. What's wrong with that? Yeah, right back at the previous proof, because then we can simplify this. You can like rearrange this to say like w cube equals s s y cube, which is the variation of the whole. Cube. So you haven't proven anything yet. Oh well, yeah, we because we've also we've also just previously said that y doesn't divide w. We've proven the implication. So y doesn't divide w. So this is not an integer. Oh, these guys have some comments. Yeah, I think you know the proof now. I think let's get these guys. So, uh, Johan? Um, right now, I'm putting like A cubed divides B cubed, right? A cube divides yeah. B cube, yeah. And by putting like B cubed over A cube, don't we assume that the whole like K is like the cube, root, the cube of the number divided by D, the number, the number from my B divided by A? So B cubed equals K times A cubed. Yeah, then K is equal to A cubed over A cubed. That's right, yeah. This step shows that K is like the cube of a number formed by A cubed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's the cube of an integer, yeah. yeah. Why do we have to then ask you that this is irrational and all that? Like? Uh, that's their proof. That's the way they're doing it. All, sir, all he's saying is that because you're assuming the hypothesis is true, right? Yeah. You, if you can rewrite the hypothesis. Then B divided by A would form in a but X would be an integer. And it would be like A would be the cube of this integer. So K equals B over A cubed? Yeah. Yeah, OK. B over, since we're assuming that A cubed divided by, divide by this B over A will form in number X. Pardon me. X, then, then so B, wh why are you saying b over a is an integer? Like, my question is that b and a are integers. So that means, and we're assuming that a cube divided by a cube that means b divided by a will form an integer. Yeah. yeah. So b over a yeah, doesn't have to be an integer though. B over a cubed has to be an integer. So b over a cubed is an integer, but b over a is not necessarily an integer. What if b over a cubed equals seven? What if it equals seven? Then 
Seven is an integer, but B over A is not. The cube root of seven is not an integer, right? So I can have numbers that are integers where the cube root of it is not an integer. If you, so if you assume that B over A is an integer, then you're assuming what we want to prove. I think, I don't know how far you can get with that, but uh, these guys, Henry and these guys, they have something which sounds like it might work, but uh, it's gotta be clear, right? Assume that the cube root of S is equal to Y over one. Okay. So assume that it's a rational number that's not an integer. Somehow you have to come at, at a contradiction. Okay, 10 minutes left in this office hour. You guys have seen those two questions for long enough. Let's look at some other questions. These are easy. Let A be a statement. If N is an odd number, then is N squared plus N an even integer? Easy, right? Can we just put in your definition of odd and then show it of the definition of odd and even? Yeah. So it is, is it even or odd? True or false? Odd squared is odd? Odd is odd. Yeah, it's, it's true. It's true. No, no, no. Odd plus odd is even. Odd plus odd is even. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Converse, you know how to state the converse, right? What's the converse? Uh, if n squared plus n is an even integer, then n is an odd integer. Okay, good. Contrapositive, you know. Okay. Oh, here's a good one. Let f of x be this polynomial with integer coefficients. If m over n is rational, is a rational root in lowest terms, prove that m divides e. So if m over n is a rational root in lowest terms, then prove that m divides e. Do you guys know what a root of a polynomial is? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. F of M of M is equal to zero. Okay, so a root is something where you plug it in the polynomial, you get zero. Yeah. So M over N is rational and it's a root. So why does M divide E? So M over N should be equal to, uh, if you input uh, X and zero. You don't input X as zero. X and M over N. So X equals M over N. Uh, M, M bar four, M I N, whole bar four A plus, and then it gives up doing it more than I think this one's easier than the last two. I think that infinite number of primes one is hard. How would they have come up with that if you didn't suggest that we multiply all primes together? Yeah. You're like, yeah, let's do P1 times P2 times P3 up to Pn and then add one to it. How would you guys have come up with that on your own? I think this one's easier than the other one. Yeah. Okay. This we don't need anymore. This is. Yeah, I spent too long on that question. Now we do something more interesting. Part of me? Oh, yeah. M, M divides zero. Okay. So E essentially has to be zero. Uh, if, if M over N is a rational rule, then essentially there's. No remainder, but he is not the remainder. But yeah, basically f of m of n, f of m over n is zero, right? Yeah. And what does it mean when it says in lowest terms? What does that mean? Yeah, I don't know what that's in lowest terms. Who can guess what it means when when uh, m over n is a rational root in lowest terms? I guess simplest form of m over n. Yeah. So what does that mean? N does not divide M. There does not exist an integer such that the integer divides M and the integer divides N. And I think both M and N have to be used. Okay, so the GCD of M and N is equal to one. Yeah. The greatest common divisor of M and N is equal to one. Yeah. Uh -huh. So F of M over N equals zero. 
So we have that a now a is an integer, right? So a times m over n to the four plus b times m over n cubed plus c times m over n squared plus d times m over n plus e. This all equals zero. Yeah, so you put the minus e basic, and you take m by n common. And then you so you're saying this whole thing equals minus e. Yeah. yeah. All right. I think you just take m out of n by n common. Okay. So factor out the m over n. Yeah. Factor out the m over n. All right. So we have that yeah, times a whatever m over n cubed plus b m over n squared plus c m over n plus d. Okay. Yeah, and that's. We just show that it's on the farm. Yeah, so we can rewrite this. We can pull that out of this and say like m times one over n times that whole thing is equal to negative e. So like we can just separate m as its whole. So m times one over n times. The whole thing. Yeah. Okay. So you want to say m times this thing over n? So this thing over n equals negative e. Yeah. All right, so we want to prove that M divides E. Yeah. So we want to say that E equals this thing times an integer. So why is this an integer? You have to now prove that N divides that thing at the top. Take out N to the power of four. Take out N to the power of four? No, N to the power of four. M over N to the power of four. You want me to remove M over N to the power of four? Yeah, m over n to the power of In addition to what I've already done here? Yeah, so because it will be like b m cube n plus b m square n square plus c m. Well, How do I take m over n to the power of four out of here? Oh, I can take it out of there, but yeah, out of here. Not here, there. Okay, so, but then what do I get over here? So when I take out m cube m n cube. So you want me to do m over n to the power of four. So this will now be just a times one. What do you want me to do? Um, okay, uh, multiply n to the power of four on both sides. I think that's I don't think that's helping. Because then you're then you're adding more n to the power of four. So it is it is doing the same to both sides. It's not making any progress. Yeah, but m is equal to. I think if you can prove that n divides that thing at the top. Is an integer. Yeah. So we need to prove that top is integer. You could try to do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the only fraction, right? Like, there's still like m over, m over n, so the fractions, we have to prove that the top part is integer, and then. Exactly. Well, actually, m over n doesn't necessarily have to be an integer. M over n doesn't have to be an integer. In fact, it's not an integer. M over n has to be a non integer, right? Because m over n is in its simplest form. So m over n is a non-integer because in lowest term m over n is rational in lowest terms. I mean, I could still like four divided by two could still be written as two and still be a rational number where m is two and n is one, right? So oh. it still be an integer. Um, but then, but then m over n is not in its low. Four over two is not the lowest terms. Two yeah. over one is the lowest. Yeah, well, that's still an integer. It's an integer, but yeah. it's not in lowest terms. No, wait, wait. Yeah, I think, uh, okay. Uh, so, um, erase this. I, I think that. Erase this. Yeah. All right. What do you want me to do next? Um, mul uh, multiply n to the power of four on both sides. All right. 
Okay, multiply n to the power of four on both sides. I have a m to the four yeah. plus b m cubed n, n yeah. squared. Oh wait, yeah. n yeah. 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 yeah, plus c m squared n squared plus d m n cubed plus e to e n four. Yeah, oh, the zero, right? yeah, you're done. Yeah, now take out m common. This is a take out what? M common from the four terms. And factor m. So a m to the four equals. No, m is factor m. Oh, m. Yeah, yeah. 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 It is factor m. Okay, so m times a m cubed. A m cubed plus b m squared n plus c m n squared. Plus d n squared plus e n to the four equals zero. You can just write that as equal to negative g. All right, so equals negative e n to the four. Yeah, and then uh, that e n cubed plus b n squared thing. Yeah, that's an integer, right? Yeah, that's an integer. Yeah, that's an integer. So make this equal to k. Yeah. So, so we have m k equals negative e. And to the four. So by definition of divisibility, you can still see it. This okay. slope. Okay. So then. M divides p and four. Yeah. So this is. Um, yeah. So M, M equals negative E N to the four divided by K. Is that what you want to do? No, no. It would be better if you wrote like something by uh, isolated E and then like wrote M, M should wrote. divide E to minus isolate E. So I have negative E equals M K over N to the four. No, no. No, separate m from that as well. So like maybe it's e equals m times k over n to the four. No, I, I would just say negative e n to the four. It's negative e is equal to m times k over n to the four. Yeah. So it's like separate m from the fraction, like k over n to the four is like one thing. Okay, so m times k over n to the four. Yeah, and there exists a, and there definitely exists a different case of like k over n. I think, I think, well, so what I did was yeah. from the step, you know, we have. You take it one step further, I mean, the negative over two. You know, the step where we have nk is equal to. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, I didn't. But you you have to now prove that still. Um, yeah, this, I don't know if you're done. Uh, like n to the four. There exists a case. These guys are excited. <laughs> this is what I did. Yeah, yeah. You have m k equal to negative e n to the power four, right? Okay. So that means that m divides. Uh, e, n, n, e, e, e n to the power of four. And since m doesn't divide n, that means that m can divide n to the power of four. And therefore, m, m, divides m e. has to divide e. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, yeah, that sounds, yeah, that sounds Is it good for you guys? And, I don't know. I was the fact that it's the, it's m by n is right and it's in its lowest term. So yeah. you can use that part to it. Yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good question, right? If that comes on the midterm, you can get it in five to ten minutes on your own. You can do that. You can get some part marks, maybe. Okay, that's all I had here. So the rest of it's easy, right? Prove that this. Prove DIC. Prove the converse of DIC. Prove this easy, easy. Pardon me? I think we did this in the assignments. Yeah, yeah, you've already done that stuff. You too, thanks. Yeah.